you just let it keep going. Uh, <clears throat> So I do want to talk about how ideas spread, and that's, uh, that's critical to me and what I do. But uh, I need to put it in a different place, and I'm glad I talked to my, my doctor friends. I didn't know there were going to be so many doctors here to kind of keep me in check. But I want to talk instead, uh, first, just to kind of get a, a base level for all of us, I want to talk about viruses, and I want to talk about how those spread. Because when people think about things spreading and taking over, uh, taking over entire populations, you really are thinking about illness. We can all get on the same page there. So I want to talk about... Uh, bird flus and swine flus and these super bugs that we're creating because you can get <clears throat> you can get antibiotics like Flintstone vitamins just that easy and soon we're going to have this massive infection from a virus that descends about descends down on us and uh, it's going to be an outbreak as soon as it goes airborne um, but and, and it's going to happen it's already happened we've had a plague um, and it probably will happen again at some point but what's more interesting or as interesting to me is uh, why why doesn't it happen? In fact, viruses, they, almost us they usually don't spread like that. They almost always die. So, so how does it work? A virus only wants to live on, so why do they stop? And why they stop really relates back to, are the conditions right for the infection? I want you to meet uh, a new friend of mine. His name is Swine Flu. His actual name is uh, H1N1 because the pork board um, lobbied hard and spent a lot of money so we'd stop calling it swine flu um, because people stopped eating ham sandwiches. Uh, and that's true. And so, so what we do know, the history about it, that it is true, is that it did come from a population of pigs, almost certainly in Asia. The virus itself turned into something very different uh, that humans could then contract and they brought, and then humans brought it to this continent, continents all over the place. So, so how did it spread and why did it work so easily? It's because viruses really thrive when we just do what humans do normally. So people cough or people sneeze. And then the other part that we all kind of have to do is breathe. And so when we breathe and we bring in those molecules of the virus, then we're probably infected. Now, there are three kinds of, there are three populations that, that don't get the infection. And that group, it's pretty simple. One, people who already have a vaccine. A lot of the viruses now, vaccines is pretty easy to get. And two, uh, the second group, people who have had it already. So kind of like chicken pox. Um, once you've had it, unless you're horribly unlucky, you're probably not going to have it again. And the last group of people are those who have a natural antibody that kill the virus. So those, that lucky group, let's put them over sort of over here and say, you guys aren't going to catch it, but the rest of us, we're all going to get this virus, and we are what is now called a population of opportunity. So what basically is a population of opportunity? It's some place that a virus can live and some place that a virus is going to take over your body. So uh, I, I want to get back to ideas now only because um, I've heard a couple coughs and sneezes, and I don't want people to move around, and, and I hear the hand sanitizer lids popping off their bottles. And I want to shift over to um, another blight on society, which is marketing, and that's what I do. So <clears throat> we've taken uh, the phrase uh, viral marketing, which is really popular now. And viral marketing is basically, it's been around forever, but, it, but it's something that we use. It's when I tell two friends and she tells two friends, and all of a sudden our ideas are all over the place. But it's also named appropriately because it almost never works. Sometimes it does, but other times viral marketing is going to fall flat and it's a tremendous waste of money. Why is that? Ideas live and ideas survive based on three simple principles that I want to go through now. And we've talked about idea incubation, and now I want to talk about idea spreading. And the first, the first part of an, about an idea spreading is it needs to be simple. As we were talking a little bit earlier, mess, uh, marketers will tell you that all of us every day see 4,000 messages that people pay to put in front of us. These are radio ads, TV ads, logos, billboards, and those sorts of things. They're all bombarding us. And we, as we heard a little bit about the brain earlier, thankfully our brain is really good at filtering and shutting those things off and shutting those things out, which is terrific. But that, it, that's still kind of like, how does that work? So I want to show you. And I'm going to work with Allison because it reduces the chance of me having a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> When we craft a message, we basically say, keep it simple and make it have one, have it one thing so that person can catch it. So uh, I have a nickel, and I'm going to throw it to Allison, and, and I'm going to show you how this works. So one idea, we're at a TEDx event. She caught it. That was easy. She grabbed it. Now, we're at a TEDx event. Then we're going to have dinner. And now you've got to pay for parking, and don't forget the sitter and all that. It's impossible. That's what a filter looks like. You start to say, get away from me with all these things you're throwing at me. I need this to stop. The next thing an idea needs to be for it to really take off is repeatable. An idea needs to be something that is not only simple, but something that other people can share. 
With that, I want to talk about uh, my buddy Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who wrote Paul Revere's Ride. It's a poem that we basically consider the true history of what Paul Re Revere's Ride was all about. So, so what is that ride? Well, we know that he got on his horse. We know that he saw one if by land, two if by audience participation. Right, and he rode through the streets, and he said, totally untrue. The poem is wrong. If he said the British are coming, which is what the poem tells us, he would have been shot within about 30 feet of the Old North Church because the British troops were already there. The important thing about the idea that was repeatable and the most important thing about what we've learned from Paul Revere's ride, he, the poem that says he went into Concord and he didn't, he went into Lexington. The poem that said he rode with lanterns, he didn't. They were up in the Old North Church. But what we saw is one if by land, two if by sea. We saw there were two. We heard that it was just Paul Revere riding through the streets. It wasn't. History tells us we know that there were at least three and probably scores of riders that took the message off to the people. And we stopped, that was the Sons of Liberty, because they knew that it was simple. It was two. The British were coming across the Charles River. That was repeatable. That idea lasted. That idea was something that people could embrace. And that's why we're now eating freedom fries instead of filet of fish. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing that I want to talk about as we talk about ideas and we talk about how ideas spread, we know that ideas need to be simple, but you also need to create a sense of pride around an idea so somebody can share it. You need to have somebody feel like they really want to have that idea go out and live on its own. And I want to talk about uh, a friend of our family. It's been a friend of my wife for a while. This is Blake Mycoski, who started a company called Tom's Shoes. Um, it happens all the time. It happened to me tonight. I'm wearing Tom's shoes now. The idea behind Tom's shoes is really simple. I buy one pair of shoes. And then somewhere else, on, somewhere else on the planet, a young person, a child, gets another pair of shoes that I paid for on his feet, and he gets to go to school. Now, it's a really simple idea because it's one for one. And people come up and tell me, these shoes are a brand all of, all of their own. They, people come up to tell me the story of the shoes. And, and yes, I do know the story. And as I talk to Blake about it, what's the value of that? He says that these shoes sell themselves. He tells me that the swooshes and the stripes of the world will give away millions more dollars than maybe he ever can. But since 2006, he's put a million pairs of shoes on children all over the world. And, and why is that so important? It's one for one. I get it. But why is it important? Let me get back to viruses for a second. The biggest barrier for children being educated in the third world is soil-borne virus. If you don't have shoes, they won't let you into school. Shoes change the world one at a time. And those stories are all told by these little shoes and on our feet. The other thing that I want to talk about that I didn't start with is what all ideas need to have at their core. The cost of entry for an idea is authenticity, and the cost of ideas, the cost for an idea needs to be truth. Authenticity and truth work together. Because as companies and individuals and politicians spend millions and billions of dollars to force feed ideas onto you, and they could be repeatable, repeatable because you hear them so many times, as they spend so much energy trying to cram this information down your throats, eventually it comes out that maybe it's not true, or maybe it's not at the core of that company. Maybe that company is not being authentic. There is no faster way to kill an idea for it to be either not authentic or not true. So we like to say authenticity and truth are ideas' greatest equalizers. So what does that mean, and, and what does it mean to be here at TED? So if you're, anything, uh, if you're anything like me, you either watch these talks online or you listen to the speakers either before me or some of the speakers we'll, we'll hear after, and you're probably sitting in your seat, and my first reaction is always, I'm really not uh, doing enough, and it's certainly not cool enough. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but. I know if you're also like me, there is something, and we've talked about it, and as Scott mentioned, there's an idea in the back of your head already. There's something that you kind of want to do. There's something that you want to share with the world. And so that idea, and my challenge for you, is to, one, make it simple, two, make it repeatable, and three, make it something that another person really wants to share and give them pride in sharing that message. And with that, I ask you to go and act tonight with those ideas and spread them. Thank you.